thanks so much for inviting me to be here. I'm excited to be here with all of you. And as I was watching all of the places where you are joining us from, I am from Northern Indiana. That's why it's really dark outside my window. Um, it is um, dark and cold here in the Midwest. So for those of you that were from Illinois, Pennsylvania and all of those other places that are not Hawaii or all of the warm places, um, I welcome you. And um, I am um, a licensed mental health counselor. I'm also a school counselor and I wear both of those hats. I have a private practice, but I also work part-time as an elementary counselor for grades K through 12, um, two and a half days a week. And um, I'm also an author. I've written two books, um, Fledge, Launching Your Kids Without Losing Your Mind and Balance Busyness and Not Doing It All. I also write for guideposts. Um, most recently have been in Evenings with Jesus. Uh, and I also am the co-host of the Midlife Moms podcast. So if you're a midlife mom anywhere um, in your 40s or 50s or even whatever you consider midlife, you can join us um, as your favorite um, podcast hosting platform. Um, I am a mom of four um, young adult and adult kids and a grandma to one and um, almost two a month from now, I'll be a grandma of two. Um, and I've um, been married for 30, almost 33 years. And um, I've been a stay-at-home mom and also a high school teacher. So all of that, and then COVID hits, right? So tonight we're really here to talk about um, pandemic fatigue. And um, this is something that I believe uh, Carol Kent, heard me talk about either for one of the seminar seminars for Speak Up or may have just been in conversation because um, two years ago this weekend, we all experienced something that we had never experienced before. And um, it is rather ironic actually that this webinar is being held on today, uh, March 14th, because almost like 9-11 or other significant dates that have affected our country, which really in my lifetime, 9-11 really is the most notable one that is a collective experience full of tragedy and um, a, collective, a, a collective experience that Im imprints us. Um, the shutdown of March of 2020 is also the beginning of this experience that we perhaps, depending on the region of country where you are living, may feel that you're finally kind of coming out of something, coming out of um, the pandemic. So tonight we're going to talk about different things. We're going to talk about kind of what we have experienced together, what you may have experienced um, on your own, and what, what has happened to our bodies in addition to what has happened around us. And then we're gonna talk about how do we handle pandemic fatigue? Where do we go from here? Um, and so I'm gonna jump right in. If you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the question and answer. I will uh, take some time at the end for us to talk about those things. And, um, I am a teacher at heart, so I tend to want to interact. And um, so feel free that if you have a question, um, I'm gonna give Helen permission to interject at any point in time along the way if you have a question that you wanna share. So here we are, the second year anniversary. How many of you can remember where you were two years ago this weekend? Um, I remember because I had just come back from India in in February, I was on a trip to India. Um, I'm on the board of directors for a medical clinic. And on the way back, um, about half the plane coming from Hyderabad, India, were wearing, um, the people were wearing masks. And we thought it was, um, there was a scared feeling that was kind of coming upon us. And then a month later, um, all of these things started happening in our own country. And if you can remember, you know, just watching those statistics on your TV and remembering um, the first cases of COVID-19 on um, the, the cruise ships, and then all the numbers on the states that were starting to overtake the maps. 
And um, uh, my daughter was a missionary at the time in, um, in a different country in Mexico. And um, actually this weekend, two years ago, um, my youngest two who were in college at the time, they were both at the same university, they were freshmen and um, seniors, they're a freshman and a senior, they came home for, for spring break and were home for good for the next six months. So a lot of things have impacted all of our lives. And I was just thinking before this webinar as I was sitting on my front porch that two years ago when everything was shut down, um, our, our bodies and our brains were experiencing something that really, um, I would say I was a former history teacher, so a little bit of the historian in me is coming out here. But other than the Great Depression and World War um, II, we really have not experienced anything like we experienced in 2020. And as things shut down for all of us, what happens with our, our body and our brain, especially, is um, our brain didn't have any reference point for how to handle or what to expect next. And so um, your brain response has a fight, flight, or freeze response. And for many of you, just the shutdown itself initially, not knowing what was gonna happen next. And then this long-term, um, this, this long-term, inability to predict what was going to happen next may have triggered uh, a lot of anxiety for, for many of you because your brain goes back to experiences that it knows are similar and it responds likewise. So fight, flight, or freeze. We couldn't flee anywhere. Uh, we couldn't fight anything because the enemy was this invisible enemy that so many people asked about or, or talked about. And um, so many of us were left with high levels of anxiety, not knowing what to expect. And honestly, we didn't know where to look for hope. Uh, for me personally, as a former history teacher, um, news has always been really important to me. So normally I would listen to the news and I would kind of come to my own conclusions about what was happening in the broader context outside of ourselves, right? We all live in our, we all live in our communities. We all live our lives. And rarely does what's happening out there truly impact our day in and, and day out. I mean, just like what we're noticing now, right? Um, prices may fluctuate, you know, inflation, all of those things that trickles down to us. But as far as things that happen on a national or global level that immediately impact us, that rarely happens. And for me, um, there was nothing in the news that I could look to for hope. There was nothing in the news that I could look to for um, something that would give me peace or security because what we were experiencing at the same time was a lot of political upheaval immediately. And um, there were then cultural factors that started unraveling at the same time. Uh, if I remember, it was late May when we started having a lot of racial unrest. And as the summer went on in 2020, it was one thing after another that kept um, compounding all of these experiences that were completely out of our control. And depending on what state you were in, um, the, the lockdowns and then mask mandates um, all of those things in those beginning months uh, were something that we've never had a reference point for what to do with. And for myself, I went back to the Great Depression for hope because that is really the only place I could go to. I need, all of us usually need to see someone ahead of us who we can look to, who we can have some security in to say, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I can look to this person and they give me hope and security because I, I know they've been through something so then I know I can make it through something. And we looked around all of us and, and there wasn't anyone we could look to, right? Most of our leaders 
um, were not very uh, encouraging or gave us a lot of stability. So all of our experiences as we've gone through the pandemic, as, as we even go back to that two year anniversary and think about those beginning days, uh, we all then started having our own journey inside of a collective journey. And um, your experiences, I'm sure, are ones that may be similar to others and yet very different. Uh, one of my own experiences that happened was I was a counselor in private practice at the time. And I also spoke, I usually spoke four to 12 times a month. And so immediately by the end of March, beginning of April, two years ago, uh, all my speaking events stopped, which was most of my income. And then my counseling clients also, we had to figure out how to, how to meet the mental health needs of my clients, which meant us doing what we're doing right now, talking on Zoom. That was the only way, which is actually was against our ethical code um, and actually legal code as therapists, because you, we doing online therapy was not something that you did unless you were trained and had certification for it and had, were abiding by the laws in your state. So um, as, as a therapist, I was experiencing a type of um, Zoom fatigue already and pandemic fatigue within the first few weeks and months of the pandemic because of the nature of working with um, clients with their own anxiety, um, their own feelings of being out of control. And we were experiencing the same thing they did right alongside them. There this was the very first time in um, 10 years of doing therapy that I didn't have, I wasn't a step ahead. I wasn't, you know, none of my training prepares you of what to do when you're in um, a national and a worldwide pandemic and you can't meet with people in person. Um, so uh, I actually went back into schools, into the school as a part-time school counselor because what I learned about myself was I needed to be with people. And so by May, I said, I need to do something where I can, I can be in person with others. Um, we've all had different experiences. And then also just noting that part of our pandemic fatigue is the fact that we all then have these personal experiences that mark us. Um, I'm just gonna ask here, and maybe you can raise your hand. I don't know, I probably can't see how in the, them if they raise their hands, but maybe they could put it in the chat. Um, if you had someone in your immediate family who um, was affected by a death of COVID, uh, if that was you, um, feel free to put that in the chat because I do want to talk about these personal experiences. Um, my father passed away from COVID in, um, on um, November 20th of 2020. And um, within a short amount of time in my small little town here in Shipshawana, even within my own church, we had multiple deaths of COVID right at the same time. And um, so my experience with it is very personal. And, um, and there have now been 900,000, more than 900,000 COVID deaths um, from the pandemic. And many of you may have experienced multiple people Okay, I'm just looking at the chat right now and you can, I think you can see my screen. So we're seeing that many of you have had friends, um, family members pass away from COVID. So I just want us to understand that part of this fatigue and part of the reason that we're even here talking tonight is that there are two different layers of this COVID fatigue. It's been this collective experience that we all have shared together of loss and um, feeling out of control, of anxiety, of uh, uncertainty. And yet for many of us, then it's deeply personal, which then makes some of these political and cultural factors even more personal 
as you hear people argue about vaccines or masks or meeting or not meeting, um, if you've had someone who has experienced a death or a severe complication from COVID, then some of those things, again, even as you're hearing people argue about them, they become very personal. So we've experienced a lot together. And uh, we just need to acknowledge that it's been a big deal. And I just want you to know that we've made it, but it's been hard. We've made it for two years. And I love this little graphic that is uh, I, that I found this little coffee mug that says, can someone wake me up when this pandemic is over? And I don't know about you, if you have ever felt like, when, when are we ever going to wake up? And this is kind of going to be over with. And I was just sharing with Helen, um, as we were starting, I've worked in a public school now since August of 2020. And last year we met at school for all 180 days. We worked very hard to keep our elementary students in school. And we wore, we wore masks every day. And I remember at the end of last year, the kids were so excited because they thought that we were gonna start the year off maskless. And we did for three days. And then after three days, the numbers started getting higher and we have spent all of this school year again, wearing masks, little kindergartners wearing masks on their face. And um, that has been the status quo up until just three weeks ago. So I now have seen my colleagues and my students for the first time without masks after two years. So um, it's been a long journey that we've been on. So let's just talk a little bit now about pandemic fatigue. Kind of what is it? Um, if you have ever heard of the term either caregiver fatigue or secondary trauma, those are items that correlate to what, uh, what we can describe as pandemic fatigue, similar to caregiver fatigue or secondary trauma. So um, a lot of nurses, um, firefighters, EMTs, um, doctors, um, even mental health counselors, people who work on the front lines carrying the burdens for others often experience caregiver fatigue or secondary trauma. It's when you are sharing the life journey with someone who is going through um, in, intense um, hardship that doesn't let up. So as their caregiver, and maybe you experience it because you are caring for an aging parent and you are the primary caregiver, or you have a child that you're caring for who has disabilities or um, who, who has uh, such severe um, needs that you don't ever get a break. It's, it's the, the caring of a heaviness that does not go away. And sometimes those who are first responders or people who work with individuals who experience severe trauma also experience a type of fatigue, um, again, called secondary trauma, which is, um, experiencing the heaviness and the weight of walking alongside someone who has experienced severe trauma. We have collectively been through something that has not stopped. And perhaps the last month, depending on where you live, maybe the first time in two years where we have felt maybe, maybe we are getting to a place where things are beginning to feel a little bit more normal, where we see a little bit of hope on the horizon. I think we were all there probably maybe by late summer last year, but then fall gave us something different that was, um, was something that we thought, could this be happening again? And, and it was. So pandemic fatigue is kind of what we're dealing with. And um, it can present in a lot of different ways. It might be a sense of um, depression that you may normally struggle with. So perhaps you were already down when the shutdown happened. Perhaps you um, struggle with seasonal depression, as many of you may, especially those of you who live in some of the colder climates. 
perhaps you were already dealing with anxiety. And when the pandemic happened and there was no end in sight, those pieces or, the, or those factors flipped a trigger in your brain that says, there's, I have no control over this. And that fight, flight, or freeze response was flipped like a light switch that didn't go off because there was no assurance um, for that anxiety, that things are going to be okay. We know when there's an end in sight, we know if we do these things, then it's going to help us because um, experiences have shown us in the past that if I do those things, things are going to be okay. Um, even using practices such as mindfulness or um, a lot of other uh, strategies that may be helpful for anxiety or depression uh, in the past may not have worked because again, there was this ongoing, not only uncertainty, but then uh, what was happening nationally in front of us on the news caused another layer, the political upheaval and the cultural upheaval that has happened through this pandemic has made um, the, whole, the, the whole experience something that um, has created a condition for many of us that it's hard to know, how do I get out of this? Um, one thing I wanna mention is that, um, kind of where do we go from here? So we've kind of talked about what pandemic fatigue is, why you might be experiencing it. But I want us to, I just wanna acknowledge that part of where do we go from here or, or what do I do? You may be thinking, Brenda, I'm just tired. I'm tired of all of it. I just want it to go away. And thank goodness we do feel like today, March uh, 14th, we're at a different place than we were a month ago. As I was preparing this talk a month ago, I, I kind of thought, I don't want to put all the finishing pieces to it. Why? Because things could change. We know things can change in just a week to 10 days. Um, now we're experiencing other uncertainties as we're watching a war um, across the ocean, not knowing what is going to happen there. But one of the first um, pieces that I want you to recognize in maybe dealing with your tiredness or your um, depressive thoughts or um, anxiety that you're still dealing with and you can't quite shake, or just a sadness, a sadness that life has changed so much for you, perhaps, or maybe your experiences through COVID have been so significant with many losses that you just, you don't know where to go from here. I want to just mention is that you you and I and many of us have experienced a collective grief. And so just like with other types of grief, we have to understand the components of grief and give yourself permission to walk through that grief. Um, the, there are five stages of grief, if you're familiar with them. Uh, the first one is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And you don't have to experience, you don't necessarily experience all st five stages. Many people do if they're experiencing grief and you don't necessarily ex experience in them in that particular order. But I want you to be aware of those five because the five stages, so denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, because knowing what you're dealing with can help your emotions, it can help your mental state when you realize that your sadness and loss is because you were grieving. Perhaps you're grieving life as you knew it, which even had some certainty with it. Perhaps you're grieving the losses in your life because of death due to COVID. Um, I, there have been two times in the last two years where I had to stop and I had to give myself the space to grieve because of so many losses, including the loss of my own father. And normally, if you've experienced uh, a death due to COVID, normally you would have had some ability to have a regular grieving process. And because of the restrictions, because of the dynamics where you live, you may not have, have even experienced the regular grief that our traditions and our practices create for us. 
you may not have had any type of graveside service. You may not have been able to um, physically be with people if you were mourning the loss of someone. Um, and you may have had multiple losses and not had the face-to-face -face interaction to help you grieve those things. So um, I just wanna say to you that if any of that resonates with you, I wanna give you permission to grieve, to do what you need to do to grieve, and to not put a time frame on it because we have a type of delayed grief. Um, for myself, when I went through the grieving process with my dad, um, my husband, my mom also had COVID who caught it from my dad. And um, my son was home from college for um, Thanksgiving break at the time. And we were in isolation from one another. So we had a graveside service, but I, I was in isolation from my husband in my own home and my kids who lived out of, out of the area who came, I could not touch them. I couldn't be near them because I was in quarantine because I'd been exposed to both my dad, my mom and my, and my husband. So I went through the whole grief process by myself in my own home with my husband in the house with me, but I couldn't even be near him. So um, when I was finally able to acknowledge some of those losses themselves, the loss of the actual grief experience, it helped me to be able to know a little bit of what to do with experiences that really seemed surreal. And um, you may feel that way. It may, be, it may feel like we've been watching Groundhog Day or we've been living the movie Groundhog Day for two years, right? We wake up and it's the same thing over and over again. Um, and it, it may not be quite that way now, um, because again, depending on where you live, things are starting to change a little bit. We're, we're starting to hear words like, we're trying to figure out how to live with this. Um, but we have been through two really hard years. And no matter what you're struggling with today, and if you are struggling with um, something in particular, please put it in the question and answer um, uh, spot or feel free to put it in the chat so that we kind of know what are you, what are you struggling with pandemic fatigue? Um, are you are you just exhausted mentally and emotionally? Have have you struggled spiritually? Um, this has caused a lot of our faith to be pretty upended for many of us. Are you dealing with your own grief um, from someone who has died from COVID, and um, you you are just having a hard time knowing how to navigate all of it? Are you experiencing some anxiety that just has not settled down? Or are you experiencing um, then even some friendship losses or family relationship losses over so many things that have been embedded with this experience, both politically and spiritually um, that had become so polarized? So who would have known that a sickness would have all of these different components to it? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop real quick before we, I go to the kind of where do we go from here to see if there are any questions or comments that need to be posted. Okay. Um, so we've got two questions. How do we help our 12-year-old grandson who we are raising? He's struggling mentally, emotionally. And then two of our children are serving as missionaries close to the Ukraine. And I'm a teacher and exhausted all the time. So I'll get to Pamela's question in the end, um, because kids, if you have children, um, they have experienced grief and loss in a way that um, may be hard for us as adults to kind of see um, their ongoing anxieties and some of the, the losses that have been taken from them. Um, so let me just go ahead and go through Kind of the eight different points that I want to share, and then we'll get to some of those questions at the end. So where do we go from here? Two years later, the first one is something I've kind of already mentioned, which is grieve your losses. Give yourself time and space to do that and be intentional about it. You may need to go through counseling yourself. Please don't rule that out. Um, the good news is that because of the pandemic, most counselors are able to do teletherapy. And so um, 
going to counseling should be more accessible than what it has been in the past because of that ability. But give yourself the ability to grieve your losses. As we're marking the second year of many milestones, perhaps in your own, perhaps in your own life, and if you haven't been able to grieve properly, like like um, having a, a service or um, being able to interact with others, uh, being able to do something, go someplace that normally would be helpful for you, please make, make the time and the energy to grieve in a way that is what you need. Which brings me to the second um, point for where do we go from here, identify your needs. Most of us as humans, especially Christians, we don't do this very well. But as humans, everything functions through getting our needs met. And in order for us to know how to, how to go a step further, how to overcome something, how to help ourselves, we need, first need to know what we need. So as you think about this pandemic fatigue and as you think about what you specifically are struggling with, I want you to be able to give yourself some time, not here in the webinar, but afterwards. And, and just perhaps it's through journaling, perhaps it's just having a conversation um, in your quiet time, sharing with the Lord, identify what your needs are. What do you need? Um, do you need more control in your life? Do you need more interaction with people? Do you need some things that are normal and stable in your life that have been missing over the last two years? Whatever it is that you need, write them down. And then um, the second part is identify what you can control. Now, I'll give you a tangible example for this. I realized two years ago by mid-May that I needed to be with people. Um, doing therapy online um, in my house where my husband was sent home. He's a teacher. My two college students were home. There was no place in my house that I even felt comfortable doing confidential online therapy because people were everywhere in my house. Um, and I realized I need, I made it as an extrovert. I'm also made to be very body kinesthetic, which means that I um, I have to experience the, the environment that I'm in. And that is actually what makes me healthy and whole is being able to interact with people and with an environment. And that doesn't happen when you are doing online therapy all day long through Zoom. So I identified my needs. And then I also looked at what I couldn't control. I couldn't control the pandemic. I couldn't control when it was gonna end or when my life was gonna go back to normal. Um, so that means that I made changes based on my needs and what I could control. And I knew that I needed to get a job doing something where I interacted with people. And so I um, reduced my private practice. I started working part-time in a public school. And I also made um, a commitment to myself. I did not do any Zoom webinars for about a year. Every, a lot of other speakers were doing Zoom webinars, right? This is great. I can do everything. I don't have to go anywhere. Um, Zoom was not for me. In fact, I even said no to speak up in 2020 because um, I had such, um, I really recognized that I was having um, Zoom fatigue and fatigue of not being in person with people and being on, on call or having things demanded in this type of space. So I made a decision for what I needed and, and I've learned from that. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. We can only change what we can control. I'm gonna say that again. We can only change what we can control. And if you can't control it, um, then, and if you exacerbate over it, that makes your anxiety worse. It causes a level of depression because you don't see hope because the hope is not tangible. So identify what you need, identify what you can control and what you can't, and then make changes accordingly based on those two things. Um, engage with nature or physical surroundings. This is something 
everyone has realized. And um, I know I'm not going to answer your question specifically about the 12 year old, but if you've got kids, especially who have been online for the last year or two years, it is incredibly important that they get out away from the computer, away from all devices, and you get out and you start interacting with nature. God has created nature around us for our benefit, not just to look at, um, but again, to feed our soul, to feed our mental health, uh, to let all of our, um, the wiring in our brain have healthy neurons that are being um, emitted. Um, being on Zoom, being um, inside, being without people, even if you aren't ready to be around people yet, be outside. That's what God has created. And it will, um, it will make such a difference for you. Um, go outside, put your feet in the grass. Uh, all of those things are incredibly important to interact with nature and with your physical surroundings. And turn off the news or limit the news and social media. I don't think I have to give any type of statistics or research to let you know that the news, um, I don't care where you get it from, doesn't matter if it's Fox News, if it's CNN, whatever the news is, uh, it's not really healthy for us right now. Same thing with social media. Uh, turn off, um, kind of go back to your grandma's day. Do you remember, probably, probably many of us here were raised without social media. We were raised with more limited TV um, and we were probably healthier. And if anything, the pandemic has shown us that maybe God is trying to get our attention to look to him, to turn, to turn our eyes to who he is, to look to the skies. I don't know about you, but if you have been outside and enjoying your physical surrounding, the sunrises and sunsets have been incredible, at least here in the Midwest. And I don't know if it's because um, life just stopped and we all had time to actually look at them or if God has actually been painting brighter skies because he's drawing us to look to the skies to him. Uh, so limit social media, limit your news and then be engaged with people. Um, be engaged with your physical surroundings and learn to listen to God. Uh, if you were to add up all of the time that you spend on social media or listening to the news and you were to replace that with time with God, um, how much more time would you have in your day full of peace and, and um, respite and hope and joy? So listen to God, spend time in his word and pray. Here again, if you are not used to these disciplines, then do what you need to do in order to make them be a consistent rhythm for you. One of the things that has been hard during the pandemic is that we haven't had consistent rhythms in our life. The good news is, is that listening to God, spending time in his word and praying are consistent rhythms we should have in our life, whether we're in a pandemic or not in a pandemic. Um, so establish some time and uh, it doesn't have to be daily necessarily, but consistent, a consistent time, whether that's in the morning, during the afternoon, right before you go to bed, but spend time listening to God, spending time in his word and in prayer. And then finally, um, I, I don't know if you can, can they see that at the bottom, Helen? Okay. Finally, be with people who are important to you. Uh, we, need to, we need to be with people who are reciprocal relationships, who don't take from you. So if you're already fatigued, um, you need to be with people who pour life into you and who you pour life into also. Uh, the people who are most important to you, spend time with them. We don't know we don't know what life is gonna be like. There's, again, there's no guarantees. So whether it's in person, through Zoom, 
Zoom has had, um, it's been a double-edged sword for many of us, right? No, I don't want to do anything on Zoom. Oh, no, wait a minute. Zoom is how I interact with people. So, um, but spend time with people. And if you're able to get out more, if your state is opening up more and you're able to travel a little bit more and you feel comfortable with that, make sure that your life is surrounded with people who are important to you um, because relationships are um, important. And so I'm going to stop now. I'm going to stop my stop my screen and I'm going to look at the question and answer and um, see here in the last 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, um, how we can um, see if there are questions in particular. So Pamela asked, how do we help our 12 year old grandson who we are raising? He's struggling mentally and emotionally. So for any of you who are parenting kids, um, pandemic fatigue, depression and anxiety and the uncertainty and lack of control has been brutal for them. Young kids through high school, um, without knowing all the specifics about how he's struggling, Pamela and anyone else who's here, um, I wanna say, first of all, is to give them a sense of security and to give them a sense of predictability and routine as much as possible while also giving him some grace. So what you have to realize is that if, you're, if your grandson's 12, he was 10 when this first happened, he's had three school years now that have not been normal. And whether he's been online, if he's been online, um, our kids who've been online, they're behind. They're behind academically, they're behind emotionally, um, they're behind um, somewhat with their ability to um, to do things in a way and a nature that normally they would have have been able to do things. Um, if he needs some assistance with mental health through counseling, then please get him that help that he needs. Um, try to validate his feelings. Um, and I'm, I'm just assuming that if he's your grandson and you're raising him, that he has his own grief and trauma, a lot of losses from whatever is the situation that you're raising him and his parents are not part of his life. So uh, what he has gone through may have been um, triggered a lot of the losses in his own life. And again, kids are grieving a lot of things. Many of them are grieving the experiences that they, that they were should have had or anticipating, including normal activities. Um, so those are just some, um, some tips, not knowing all the specifics, but that is not a, an uncommon experience that kids, are, um, that kids are experiencing. So I just wanna mention that um, we have Kay is here with us and two of her children are serving as missionaries close to Ukraine. And so, um, Kay, your uncertainty is probably being exacerbated right now. And I wish we had some answers for you other than um, stay close to the Lord and trust that he is going to um, hear your prayers and protect your kids. Um, my own experience was um, when the borders were shut down and I didn't know if my daughter was going to be able to get home. Um, just that feeling of being completely helpless, it's hard. Um, we've got someone who says that they're physically and mentally um, exhausted, but things, uh, as things open up, I'm expected to get involved and engage with the regular activities. And so you may be, um, that may have some anxiety for you too. So I heard that expectation, you're expected to do these things. And yet I understand it. I understand it is hard to get out there like we normally would have done because we have, we have this hesitancy. And even if we aren't afraid of the getting the virus, um, maybe some of you are, maybe some of you are not, but just the level of life that we lived before, it's kind of hard just to jump right back into that. Um, how do I handle not being able to see my family in another country? I've not been vaccinated due to um, personal reasons, so wouldn't be able to visit them. Um, how to handle that. Um, I'm going to go back to grief and loss. 
I think you have to acknowledge for anyone here in the thread, those of you that are grieving the experiences that you want to be able to do is to be able to, again, acknowledge what it is. It's a grief and a sadness at, because it's a loss. And um, so do as much as you can to be able to engage with those family members, whether it is, again, through Zoom, um, through texting, through talking on the phone. Uh, these are things that, again, what do you have control over and what you don't have control over? So go back to that question. You may not have control over being able to see them, but you do have the ability to, to be in touch with them, hopefully through texting, through email, through, through Zoom, through phone calls. Um, okay, so struggling with not being able to see my family and friends all over the country, never realized how important interacting in person was. And I started journaling and sending notes. Okay, that is a really good idea. See, that's a practical um, example of someone who has been able to do something in addition to. Um, when I work with kids who are experiencing the loss of a parent, so whether it's a parent who's in the military and they can't see them, perhaps it's a parent that they don't have contact with or they don't have control over contact with that parent. There's a lot of kids who have um, an absent parent in their life who is doing, um, who chooses not to visit them, who disappoints them consistently because they don't show up for visits. Um, I often encourage kids to do exactly what you just said, which is a tangible experience of dealing with your grief and frustration and loss. So journaling and sending notes, writing to that person, let them know what you want them to, to say, what you wouldn't want to say to them if you could. And honestly, friends, these tangible experiences that were normal a generation ago, sending notes, opening up, up cards in the mail, actually um, you know, sending a care package, all of those things that have become um, kind of archaic because we can text someone, we can do virtual reality, we can do what we're doing right now through Zoom. Um, those things actually have life-giving properties of them. That's why God created us to not live in a world that is dictated by technology. Um, so I just want to encourage you to try to be as old-fashioned as you can because those things are actually very helpful. Um, and we've got a question, how can I best support my son and daughter-in-law who are a doctor and nurse and another son who served in the military in Germany is home after two years and is not getting out. How can we help? Um, ask them what they need. That is the best way any of us can help another person is to ask them what they need and then follow through with what they say they need. If they just need prayer support, then pray for them. If they need um, other type of support, then do, if, if you are able to, um, then do what it, what it is that they need. If they are expressing boundaries, mom, I just need um, my own time right now, I'm not ready to see you because I'm so tired, then respect that and then pray for them. Check in on them. I have, um, I have someone in my life who is like a daughter to me, who is a nurse who is experienced, who is a COVID nurse on an ICU unit. And she's experienced um, multiple experiences with, um, with trauma, with caregiving. And um, she lost someone very significant in her life due to COVID. So as we have, um, as I've walked with her, I have learned to ask the words, um, what do you need? And someday she'll say, I need this. And I'll be glad to rush in and do that. Someday she says, I just need to be by myself. And Respecting people's boundaries with what they need is one of the best ways that we can support those who we care for. And then Laura says, I'm a teacher and I'm exhausted all the time. Um, I understand that, Laura. Um, thank goodness we have the breaks that are built in. Um, we're approaching spring break. Many of you may have it right now. Um, Laura, I would really encourage you to ask yourself, what about your job is what you, what keeps you going every day? Um, for me and for my husband, we look at those kids 
through those masks. And um, I have to tell myself that if, if all that I do today is the best that I can offer, then I've done my job. And Laura, I don't know your experience because all schools are different, all states are different, um, depending on the climate in your building. If you need to take a year off, take a year off. If you need to look at a change, maybe a change is, is due for you. Um, the one thing that I have learned as an educator is that there's always going to be jobs out there. Um, there's, there's a teacher shortage nationwide. There surely isn't, excuse me, in Indiana. So take care of your own mental health. And that does not mean that you're just going to have um, pedicures or have a bubble bath at night. Uh, I know that that's not the answer. But go back to the intrinsic reason why you went into education to begin with. And then um, really lean into that and know that the work that you're doing is eternal work. And every moment that you are with a child, you are imprinting their life in a way that you will never know until you get to heaven. Um, and then surround yourself with people who are important to you and who care for you. Okay. Um, I, those are all the questions, Helen. Do they you are, they any are other questions all the questions. We have a lot of stuff in the chat, but we really are almost out of time. And I did want to give Brenda, like Brenda has written, she mentioned her books, but could you put up the, the balance business book? Cause I wanted to draw attention to the, yeah, balance business. So Brenda does a, it's a, not about what is it doing it all? Yeah. So, balance busyness and not doing all finding balance during the busiest years of parenting. So it's a parenting book, but I think all of us could probably read that what, no matter how old our children are. How's that sound? Yeah, uh, you can get this on Amazon. And then Fledge, can you show them Fledge and tell them about Fledge? I love this book is cool. I need, I don't need this book anymore, but I wish I'd had it. Go. Sure. So um, Fledge is for all the parents in between the full house and the empty nest. It's the book for when, uh, for what I've been doing for the last 12 years. Uh, once my first one left, I still had, was raising these kids. And so you're you've got one foot into raising adult or being a parent to adult and young adult kids while you're still dealing with teenagers, junior high kids, elementary, maybe even babies. But it really is about that season before the empty nest. When your nest is emptying, um, you're in midlife, everything is changing. And um, this really is a handbook for parents, especially moms in that stage of life. And if you're a brand new empty nester, I, re I reread it often. Um, can I, I didn't see, can I repeat the name of your podcast? My podcast, the Midlife Moms podcast. We also have a Facebook group around the Midlife Moms podcast. So find the podcast, go to your Facebook search bar for groups and search for Midlife Moms podcast. There you go, Helen. Thank you. Sure. Well, I really just want to thank Brenda. Brenda and I are just getting to know each other and I already am planning on inviting her back on the balance subject. And, uh, but she also has uh, a lot of different things that work for us. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also would like to end with a prayer because we mm -hmm. talked about a lot of heavy stuff today. So I just to say uh, a cleansing prayer for all of us. Lord Almighty, I thank you for this uh, information that Brenda has shared with us and she's helped us identify that we all have had an impact that these last two years have had an impact on us. And she's helped us to see that we're all grieving something and, and that some of us have much, very heavy grief, Lord. I pray for that grief for each of us, Lord. And I pray for those who are experiencing new impact in their life with what's going on across, she said, across, you know, in Ukraine and Russia, Lord, we pray for all of the world, Lord. We know that we pray for everyone to have peace through you, Lord. You are the peacemaker. You are the one that will bring us peace. You're the one that will heal us, Lord Jesus. So we pray for each of us, all of us listening, and just our children, our grandchildren, the future generations. We pray, Lord, for your peace to rain down on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.